I want you to imagine that no matter how good your father was growing up, I want you to imagine that as a young child, you didn't have a father. But now, you get to choose any father that you want to be your dad. Who would you, and this has nothing against your, your, your real dad now, but who would you choose if you got to choose and you had no father? I had to think about this, and I, I, I thought of some names that I would like, and maybe some, and I try to get a variety here. I thought of, like, Peyton Manning. How cool would it be, Peyton Manning's son, to grow up to have all this insight to the locker room and be able to go to all these camps and money to do whatever you needed with that? What about, and I know this could be a touchy subject, what about the son of the President of the United States? Now, it could be now, it could be the last one, the one before that, so and I'm not saying any of them, any of them. And maybe, I don't know, there'd be a lot of pressure. I don't know if I'd want that or not. What about, uh, like, a, a famous musician? I thought of Paul McCartney, somebody, you know, famous Beatles, somebody who's been around a long time. How cool would that be to be have access, as somebody who is a musician myself, have access to all of the, the instruments and all these famous artists out there? What a, an actor like Tom Hanks. How cool would it be to be able to go to all these sets and these movies and say, that's my dad up on the big screen, or... You know, so for some of you who, who like the TV show, I think it's called Fixer Upper, Chip Gaines. You know, the, the guy who, you know, he's a Christian man, so you, you get to be raised in the house of the Lord, but your, your, um, your dad's famous on TV. He's, he can fix up, you know, your, your home and do all that stuff and teach you all that. Or lastly, I thought of Rick Warren, you know, one of the most famous pastors in the past 30, 40 years. Mega church out in California. He's, he's given the, the inaugural prayer to numerous presidents. What would it be like to be their son growing up? What, I, I'm curious. Any, did you, any, anybody come to your mind of who you thought? Who, who, anybody else that I, didn't leave, I left out that you would think would be a really cool dad to grow up with? Nobody? All right. If you're online, type something in. I'd love to hear any other thoughts. Today we're looking at this song. So every few weeks here at Songs of Hope, we love to look at a worship song. And we love to look at a worship song that we often hear on the radio if you listen to Christian music or, or maybe you have it downloaded on your phone or on a, maybe you're old-fashioned, have a CD or a, a tape. But we like to share what does a song mean and how can we apply it? So much of what we do here at Songs of Hope, and I think every church should do this, is how do we apply the message that we're hearing God's word, how do we apply this to our lives? How do we come closer to God, build a relationship with him? And so we're looking at the song, No Longer Slaves, and to give you a little background, this was actually a wrong uh, song written by Bethel Music. They've written a bunch of uh, praise songs that we've done. It was actually released in August of 2015, so what, seven years old now. And as Bethel Music's lead single, it was from their seventh album called We Will Not Be Shaken. The song actually won Worship Song of the Year and the um, annual GMA Dove Awards in 2016. So let's hear, here is jo or Jonathan and Melissa Helser from Bethel Music and how they share what this song inspired them to write it from CCM Magazine. They said this song is a theme of freedom from fear. Over and over again, they say the compelling lyrics remind us of this truth. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. That comes from 1 John 4.18. It's mind-blowing to think that we can be free in a physical sense, yet in bondage to fear. The theme of the song echoes Galatians 5.1, the Apostle Paul writing to the churches in Galatia, which says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. But then... I don't know about you, I, I actually equate this song more to Zach Williams, more of a, he, he's a Christian rock uh, artist now, and he redid this song, and, and that's the song I've heard more often than the Bethel version. And here from God.TV, it tells us about his experience. He says, the Grammy Award-winning American Christian artist Zach Williams decided to record all of the songs on his Survivor album, the album called Survivor, in Harding Prison which if you haven't before, I strongly encourage you, go to YouTube, look up Zach Williams, whether, number one, this song, uh, a slave to, or No Longer Slaves, and then look up, uh, he has, did a whole album, it's recorded in this prison. 
and just imagine, we're going to sing this song here again at the end. And when you listen to these words about being entrapped and enslaved and being trapped, these men and women in this prison physically know what that's like. And to hear them sing this song was incredible. So I strongly encourage you to look at that. But going forward here, it says, the album included the powerful rendition of the Bethel worship song, No Longer Slaves, sung along with inmates. The song brings so much hope to our brothers and sisters in prison who can relate to its lyrics. It reminds them about the love of God for his people and that they are no longer slaves to sin. No matter what they did in the past, no matter how painful the wounds of their sin are, God wants to restore them. When Jesus is with us, he says, we are no longer slaves to our fear. The blood of Jesus renews us. We are his beloved children, and he already saved us from our past and our present sins. And just like he forgave the prisoners in hardened prison. So I'll ask you this question, and, and I don't want you to raise your hand, but just ask yourself this. How many of you can tell yourself that you're often controlled by fear? How many of you wish that was not the case, which I would think would be a no-brainer if you feel like you're controlled by fear, which sometimes it's an addiction, that you have the fear that you can't get out of something that you've tried on your own and you're just trapped and you're fearful. Will I ever get this back again? I think fears are so natural and so common and sometimes they can just trap us and, and what they're talking about here actually enslave us from what we want to do. Speaking of fears, though, there were the, these two guys that were in an, an insane asylum and one night they decided they just didn't want to live there anymore. They were tired of this lifestyle. They decided they were going to escape. They made it to the roof and they came to a narrow gap where they could see the rooftops leading to the town. In the moonlight, they could see their way to freedom just by going across the rooftops. Well, the first guy jumps across the gap with no problem at all. But his friend didn't make the leap because he was afraid. He was afraid of falling. So the first guy who, who crossed over the gap said, I have my flashlight with me. I'll shine it on the gap between the buildings. You can then walk on the beam and join me. But the second guy just shakes his head and says, What do you think? I am crazy? You're going to turn that off as soon as I'm halfway across. <laughs> we all have our rational fears at times, right? So the song, you know, we like to look at the lyrics of the song and how can we apply this. The song actually starts off with a bunch of oohs. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I don't know what that means. Just So we're not going to dissect that part. But then it goes into, you unravel me. And he's talking to God. You, you unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song. Just picture this imagery that they're writing about. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies. Till all, not some, till all my fears are gone. What kind of fears is he talking about? Fears of spiders, like all my family? Fears of heights? Fear of public speaking? Which, by the way, you, I don't know if you've heard before, it's pretty common, I, I've heard it often, that, you know, fear of public speaking, basically what I'm doing now is, is one of the top one or two fears that most people have in the world. And that I think dying, actually dying, is like the number three fear that right after that. So I think Jerry Seinfeld once said, more people would rather be in the casket at a funeral than given the eulogy, which is, I'm up here, this is like, it just baffles my mind, but we all have the, these fears. So, but he's not talking about these types of fears. The artists who are writing this song are speaking about the irrational fears, fears that we have no control over. The fears that Satan, our enemy, does everything possible from loving God and getting us closer to God. I'm reminded of part of Psalm 23, most, one of the most famous psalms or famous scriptures in our Bible. It says where the, David is writing, Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. Basically, even though I'm in the darkest time of my life, I don't know where I'm going or what I'm going to do next, I'm not going to fear. I will fear no evil. For you, God, you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they come for me. You prepare a table in the presence of my enemies. Uh, my, it was probably six or eight months ago, we did a, a message about the book, um, having a seat at the table. We dissected this whole thing. And the whole point is God is there 
even when our enemy Satan is against us and doing everything he can to stop us from getting closer to God or having a life that we want to enjoy, God will pull up a seat and he's there with you. And then as you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. The thing we need to remember tonight, though, is we cannot allow our fears to control us, which is easier said than done, right? The song goes on. I'm no longer a slave to fear because I am a child of God. I'm no longer, he repeats it, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. So we were talking earlier about who would you want to be as your father? Can there be anybody better than the God who created everything that we've ever known? The universe, the stars, the planet, who was and is and is to come. Romans 6, Paul is writing to the church in Rome's in churches in Rome when he says, don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, which so many of us are, we're, we're bound by the sins that we keep repeating that we don't want to do, which leads us to death or to obedience, which leads us to righteousness. What are we slaves to? But thanks be to God that through, though you have used, or though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been, been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. We are no longer bound. Galatians 4, here again, Paul is writing to the churches in Galatia 4.4 4, when he says, But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship, that all of us could be adopted to God. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father, which is the most dearing, most dearing term you can have to God. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are God's child, God has made you also an heir. Last Sunday, um, and he's not here tonight, he had something come up. Pastor Dan had a really good message at our parent church center, and he talked a lot about child of God. And it's often misconstrued that anybody, uh, everybody is a child of God. It's a, it's a great thought because we all want to think we're, we're children of God, but that's, that's not really the case. It's not what our Bible tells us. We were all made in his image. He loves us each individually so much that it was just one of us here on earth. He still would have sent his only son to die for our sins so that we can have eternal life with him, a perfect father. But we are only adopted into his kingdom when we give our lives to God through his son, Jesus Christ. That's how we become heirs. And, and many of you are tonight, and you can do that immediately if you decide to. But then when we do that, we are children of God. The verse goes on. Second verse. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name. I've been born again into your family. Your blood flows through my veins. Now, David, who we referenced earlier in Psalm, 1, Psalm 23, says here in Psalm 139, 13, for you formed me, he's talking to God, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. Just imagine him knitting, just putting us together. He knew us in our mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it well. I heard a, a line, um, there's a couple of uh, quotes I, I've really enjoyed from Billy Graham over the years. And one I heard not too long ago, I completely try to preach this, this from this quote. And he, and he stated, I love to prepare my sermons with a Bible in one hand and a newspaper in the other. Now, I know newspapers are becoming more outdated, but the whole point is, what are we going through in our society, in our culture? What are we dealing with now? What does God say about that? In this verse, this is something a lot of churches don't talk about, but I think we need to know where God stands on this. Right now, 
if you've uh, stepped outside your house in the last three weeks, there's a lot of controversy, there's a lot of hate about this topic of when we are known as humans, when we are, when God knew us, when we are actually born, when we are here on this earth. And a few things I want to say about this and, and clear the stance that I think God wants us to do. Number one, we as Christians overall need to do a much better job of sharing our communication of what we feel. For too long, whether it be this subject or other subjects, where we feel there's sin in the Bible and we know God doesn't want us to do that, we hammer people over the head and say, why can't you believe like we do? Why can't you understand us? Paul tells us it's not our job to judge who's outside the church. It's our job to hold those people within the church. We want to get people to understand who God is and who Christ is, and then we will be convicted. But we, for too long, just want to battle and argue our point. Our current protesting and slamming our opinions through arguments that don't agree are a sin, and that is not loving our neighbor, which is the greatest commandment, right? Love God with all of your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's everybody. Are we doing that when we are always arguing our point, trying to win an argument with people who don't agree with us? We are to love and protect not only the unborn baby, but the mother who is making a very difficult decision in her body. I don't know what she's going through as a man. I have no idea what these decisions are like, and I can't imagine how difficult they are. So I can't understand. I try to empathize. But we must do everything we can to love and support the babies, whether they're unborn or born, as much as we do the women that are going through any of these struggles. And we must learn to forgive people who have made the decision, whether it's an abortion or anything of those decisions. And there's no black, in my, my opinion, I don't think there's a black or white wins uh, uh, the right time and when not, but if we do something, whether it's this or anything else that's a sin against God, he'll forgive us. We need to forgive others as well. And this is why, and I've heard this a lot recently, and I thought, we, we need to take action. So I know I talked to Jay, um, Jay Wright, who runs the Celebrate Recovery Next Door and has some other nonprofit um, classes that they do with the Peace Oasis that he and his wife Sheila run. But I asked him, I said, do you guys do anything with uh, pregnancy, crisis pregnancy, or, or adoption? Because we as Christians, if, if we're going to ask that we spare as many lives as possible, of unborn babies, then what are we going to do to help the mothers who have to endure this that wouldn't have otherwise? And so he's going to give me some information. We're going to start taking collections to give to at least our our, our local community of those who are, are going through these struggles. We're going to do everything we can to love all people. Now, the song goes on. I am surrounded by the arms of the Father. I am surrounded by songs of deliverance. We have been liberated from our bondage. And because of this, we are sons and daughters. Let us sing our freedom. You know, we just finished up celebrating our, our 4th of July freedom, right? What a great opportunity we had this past Sunday. No, Monday. I had to think what 4th of July was. Of celebrating, you know, a lot of fireworks, a lot of fun. And we should be, we should celebrate that our country has these freedoms. But what's even better than that is the freedom that we have in God, that he provides us a way, taking us away from our bondage and fear that the enemy tries to put on us. Then the song builds up when it goes, and, and this just gives me goosebumps every time I hear it. You split the sea so I can walk right through it. My fears are drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and say, I am a child of God. You see, you don't have to stay a slave of fear. Most of you know the story about Moses in the Old Testament, you know, raising his arms in the Red Sea parting. So just as a quick context, he's delivering God's chosen people at the time, the Israelites, away from Pharaoh, away from Egypt. They were actual slaves doing slave labor. God rescues them, takes them away. But Pharaoh then changes his mind and chases after them. All of a sudden, they come to this, this great body of water, and, and they're saying, what are you done? Can't take us out here to drown and kill us? We were better off as, as slaves. At least we could be taken care of day by day. But that's when God told him, you can part the waters. I will take you through. I will deliver you from your slavery. And that's what 
the author is talking about here. Verse 14, 21. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night, and the Lord drove back the sea with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided. All the, er, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. I can't even imagine how incredible that was to see. Then the song ends up, I am a child of God. Yes, I am a child of God. You know, they actually say that 10 times in this song I counted. 10 times they remind us that we are children of God. And, and just a few ideas here again. How do we practice this? How do we make this happen? To stop being a slave of fear? You stop being a slave to fear by becoming closer to God. Maybe that's by listening to this song. I've listened to this song over and over again. I, I like to play the guitar, so I've been playing my guitar to it. And every time I do it, I just feel the Holy Spirit in, in my bones just give me so much encouragement and hope. I've got fears. I've got things in my life that I wish I could get over. This song encourages me through that. That's what Christian music does. So I encourage you, take this song, download it, buy a CD, whatever it takes. Listen to it every day if it takes. Listen to the song over and over again to be reminded you are no longer a slave to fear. Meet regularly with other Christian friends. That's, I'm always talking about the importance of getting together with groups of people to encourage each other, to, to share things that are going on in your, in your life that's troublesome. And if you want to get together and you don't know who, talk to me. I'll try to matchmake you too. Uh, and I couldn't think of a better word. To somebody, to, to another, peop, another person or group of people that want to help just get each other closer to God. And, and the last thing is increase your prayer life. If you're struggling with all these fears and anxieties or depression, whatever that is, how much are you praying to God and asking for his help? He wants to talk to you. He wants to hear from you. Get down on your knees at times. You don't have to. I pray to him as I'm taking a shower. I pray to him as I'm walking in and out businesses during the day. Pray to him. At least 365 times in our Bible. And there's a little bit of controversy based on interpretations of, of how many times, but there's been a lot written at least 365 times in our Bible. It says, fear not. What, what's 365 days? Every day of the year. And I think it's actually a devotion that you can do to read a different scripture every day. God does not want us to live in this fear and be a slave to this. So in each of the baskets, I put these little name tags. Hopefully there's enough for each. If in your basket you don't have one of these and you like one, there's plenty of the others, and I've got some in the back. It says, hello, my name is. I put a child of God. Now, you don't have to write on it now. You can take it home, do whatever you want with it. If you are a Christian, if you've given your life to Christ, you are a child of God. You have eternity in, in heaven forever with a perfect and holy father. You are a child of God. Let's pray. Father, I, I thank you for these promises. I thank you that you understand that we do have fears, and, and some of them may seem irrational, but some of them are, they're so but it doesn't matter whether we, what we struggle with or how real they are to us or what other people think of them. You know what we are going through. You know how we feel, and you are always there with us, just holding out your hand, asking us to trust you, asking us to just take your hand and go with you. Give us the boldness this week to let go of our fears as best we can. Pray to you and ask for your help. Ask for help for those around us to give us encouragement, to listen to this song, to be reminded of your truth. Help utilize this song to remind us of our place as a child of God. And I ask those who, who don't know you right now or haven't given their lives to you, Father, help them make this decision that they want to be a Christian. They want to give their life to Jesus and have this opportunity. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Let's stand and sing the song one more time. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of delight.